In a home inspection, we we generally don't pay attention to minor cosmetics. Okay. So if you're into, you know, paint chips or scratches in the floor, unless they're really major, um, our scope of work is to give you an idea of what's wrong with the house. Not only that, but talk about regular maintenance items. You know, you, going back down to the basement, we try to point out water shutoffs. Um, you know, we explain different ways breakers get reset. We try to give people a good idea of how their house functions as a whole, instead of just pointing out issues that are going on. You're listening to Realtor In Your Pocket podcast. Do you want a head start on buying, selling, or renting in Ottawa? You're in the right place. Every episode brings you great advice and insight that you can keep in your back pocket until you make your move. And now, here's your host, Nick Funditis. So I'm going to take you into the real estate questions now. The talk. So today's topic is um, what happens in a home inspection. So this is this video is in a series of videos that I have for generally first time buyers, although it can be useful for sellers too. Uh, so first of all, walk me through a typical working day for you. What is it? What does a home inspector's day look like? So for me, we like to get to the house a little bit early. Uh, both myself and my dad who conduct the inspections prefer to show up about 15, 20 minutes early, get a good feel for the house, walk around the outside, get up on the roof, you know, from working with us, we you usually show up and we're pretty close to finish the outside. Uh, so that's how we like to start our inspections. Uh, we like our clients to follow along with us um, as we go through. And after that, we get into the basement. We start getting into the electrical panel, uh, furnace, hot water tank, the structure. Um, a lot of the basements are finished, so we don't get a great look at the foundation. But we have different tools to help us along with that. Um, okay, tell a little bit more about those tools. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. we use moisture meters down in the basement. Both, both contact, which is basically um, you put the meter up against the wall and it reads a little bit in behind the drywall for moisture. Um, usually you get about between five and 12 to 13% moisture readings and that's stable material, okay? Um, if you're looking at uh, wood products or hardwood floor installs, stuff like that around eight to 10% is what they look for to be installed. So that's not an alarming number. When you get into, you know, the 20 to 50, 60, 70 percent, that's when we, we start looking a little bit closer at uh, things. I know I know you've been a part of maybe one or two of those. Oh, yeah. uh, so for the moisture scans, we do the entire basement. Um, if it's just a regular foundation that we can see, we don't typically scan the foundation because you're able to put your eyes on it rather than try to read in behind the material. Mm -hmm. Uh, the moisture meters also have a probe setting, which allows us to poke into spots if one we're allowed to, and two if we have to dig a little bit further. So it gives us a, a pinpoint, uh, which we'll use in sealing stains and stuff like that. Um, we do electrical testing of all the outlets that we can gain access to. We open up the furnace, we open up the electrical panel, and continue through the basement until we're finished answering all clients' questions, moving on to the main floor. And at the main floor, we're opening windows, we're doing uh, ceiling scans of the flashlight, continuing with electrical testing, uh, checking over the floors. In a home inspection, we, we generally don't pay attention to minor cosmetics. Okay. So if you're into, you know, paint chips or scratches in the floor, unless they're really major, um, our scope of work is to give you an idea of what's wrong with the house. Not only that, but talk about regular maintenance items. You know, you, going back down to the basement, we try to point out water shutoffs. Um, you know, we explain different ways breakers get reset. We try to give people a good idea of how their house functions as a whole, instead of just pointing out issues that are going on. Right on. So jumping back upstairs, um, we have a tool called an infrared camera. So infrared thermography shows temperature difference. And basically when pointed at a wall, it can show you moisture, missing insulation, a couple of other different things, but you'd need to have that temperature difference. If it's 30 degrees outside and 28 degrees in the house, you're not gonna get a good contrast. So coming into this time of year or houses that are air conditioned through the summer, um, they give us that good contrast to use that tool effectively through the main floor, upper floor and scanning ceilings where the attic is. 
Um, the second floor is a lot like the main floor on a two-story house where we're into window testing, we're into electrical testing, uh, we turn on all taps, we check toilets to make sure there's no leaking, we look underneath sinks, um, and then we finish up the inspection in the attic. Um, we look for any rodent infestation in the attic, we look for moisture, water staining on the sheathing to make sure roofs aren't leaking. We check insulation levels. We look for different types of insulation as well, um, asbestos, things like that, that can be hiding up under layers of insulation. Um, it's common practice for us, even in houses up to the 1980s to dig right down to the vapor barrier to make sure there's nothing hiding underneath there. Okay. So that, that's pretty much the home inspection in a, in a five minute uh, spiel. Hey, it's Nick Funditis. Question. What's your favorite social media platform? Are you big on Instagram? Do you Reddit? No matter where you are, I'd love for you to find me there and connect. All you need to do is type at Nick Funditis and follow and let's you and I connect. I'd love to be able to provide you the right answers, the right resources and the right content to help you make your next move. If you send me a question, I always answer back. So subscribe and I'll see you there soon. <laughs> That's good. And you know, how long now for somebody who's not never done it before, how long should a home inspection last? How, how long do they take usually? Say so if, like, a, say a three bedroom town home, which might be a common thing that somebody's buying as their first home. Yeah. So if I'm doing them by myself, a three bedroom town home, I mean, if, if I'm doing it with no clients, it's about an hour and a half. It depends on the client because some will have more questions than others. I would say two to two and a bit hours. Yeah. for a townhouse two to three hours for a single family home but like I said with the clients following us around we've had inspections where they don't have many questions or there's not a whole lot going on with the house and we're done in an hour 45 there's yeah. other ones the same house with a different client if you know if they have more questions they're you know they, they're learning as they go we spend a little bit more time with regular maintenance furnace filters stuff like that it's it can push two and a half three hours so yeah. And I, I've been on, I've been on both of those with you guys. So with, with both types of clients, yeah. uh, but that's good. And one of the things that I, again, that I do really like working with you guys is that you, you welcome those questions. You welcome having the, the buyers come along with you and you, you answer, you answer in enough detail so that, that the new home buyer is, is satisfied and they have a little bit more comfort knowing what they're going to get into. Now, my next question is, um, is what is, what is different about a home inspection from what a lot of people think it is? Now, I'll, I'll start this by saying a, a lot of people on their first home inspection want to know whether the home has passed or failed a home inspection. And I always tell clients, I said, we're, you know, we're not there for that. Really what we're looking, what, you know, what Scott and Mark are going to do is they're going to go through the home with you and they're going to give you a list of every problem that they can find that's not cosmetic. And then you guys can have a talk about what you want to do about it. Yep. And, and you're absolutely right. We, and right from when my dad started doing this years and years ago, there's no pass or fail for us. I mean, there's different, different houses where our comfort level is not the same. And we will, we'll tell clients that we're not overly comfortable with you moving ahead with this purchase, but I mean, it, it's all up to the client. It's their, their tolerance level. We've had clients where they are going, yeah, we plan on owning this house for five years and then tearing it down. So we know the foundation's in rough shape, but we're okay with that. And we've also had clients go, absolutely not asbestos around the heating ducts. I'm moving on. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I mean, it's their investment, right? So within the inspection, like you said, we tell them everything that we can find. Um, I think one common misconception is we're able to find everything. Right. We're limited with our amount of time in the house. We're not allowed. We're not supposed to move furniture. We're not supposed to, um, you know, take things apart to look at things. We're not allowed to open up drywall. We can't see in behind drywall. We have the best tools, some of the best tools in the industry to, to help us with that. But there's going to be things as homeowners that will come up that are kind of out of our control, right? It's, it's kind of like owning a car. If you buy a brand new one from a dealership, you're going to have to do breaks. You know, there's regular maintenance stuff that you're going to have to do, which the inspection does not, it doesn't uh, cover you for that, right? It's, it's more to protect what you're buying and making sure you're not buying something that's 
going to be a liability, but windows and roofs come up, you know, that's, that's part of home ownership. There's certain situations with water in a basement, you know, if we have a dry, dry year, and then all of a sudden a heavy rainfall, that basement may have not seen water for 15 years or ever. And all of a sudden it happens. Yeah. And that's not really something we can, we can predict. So we try our best, but I think if uh, answering that question, honestly, that's, that's going to be one of the things. Good. Uh, so for a home buyer, so on a, someone on the purchase side, how can they get the most out of working with a home inspector? So I think ask, you know, go online, do your research. We love clients with some knowledge, you know, the, the shows on TV, they usually set people up with some pretty good questions. Hold people, hold us accountable, right? There, there's nothing better than somebody who will ask the questions, especially the hard ones, you know, make us think. Um, it's great. It, it keeps us, you know, keeps us sharp. It uh, keeps us motivated. I, I love it. I well, love it. gives it. you guys an opportunity to demonstrate that you know what you're talking about. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. On the home seller side, you know, we, we have you sometimes work with us. What, what are some ways a home seller can use an inspector? Because a lot of times on the, you don't think of that on the seller side. You, people will think of it as something that the home buyer hires. Yeah. Well, this morning's a prime example, actually, the house we did out in Prescott. Uh, it was a pre-listing inspection and it was uh, two lovely ladies selling the house. They, uh, they had some electrical issues and they used our inspection before the end of the inspection. They were on the phone with the electrician. And uh, it was some ungrounded wiring. So they were going to, they were going to have him switch out outlets anyways, to kind of spruce things up. And within the same phone call, they're, you know, putting in GFI outlets to try to, you know, deal with that. It gives people an idea of what they're selling, right? People often live in their home and they don't, they don't pay too close attention or update, you know, throughout the years. So with that on the selling side, you kind of eliminate a little bit of a negotiation for people coming in, um, doing maybe their own inspection. Um, no house is perfect either. I mean, to go through a pre-listing inspection and you have items that come up and then you can show receipts for work that you've done or things that you've repaired, I think shows a lot to a buyer. I mean, it, for myself, if I was buying, I saw that that would add a bit of confidence. Yeah. Yeah, so, sh so shameless plug to both to both to Scott and to, uh, to my team here. I actually hire Scott and his team every time we list a home, and that's to, um, to, to do a pre-list inspection. And what that means is that Scott will come do a full inspection of, of the houses we list so that we can provide that both to the home seller to, so they have an idea of what problems they might want to get ahead at, like you said in Prescott with that, those GCFIs and the ungrounded outlets, but also it's because of their great reports that we can provide to a potential home buyer to say, hey, you still may want to do your own inspection with your own, with your own home inspector, and that's fine. But we have also done it with a very good inspector to give you a little bit of confidence if it's helping you decide, you know, what side of the fence you're on, whether you're making an offer or not. Yeah. Um, and, and your, your inspection reports are great. I might link one of them in the show notes just to show, uh, the links that you have in yours to different kinds of maintenance and things like that. I think that the visuals in those are excellent. Yeah. Our report software, if you don't mind, if I, uh, if I add on to that a little bit, I mean, for the people that like reading, we, our reports are generally between 30 and 45 pages. They're electronic. So PDF files, um, or they're through an email link and they're saved for as long as I'm in business. So if you lose your report, you just send me a quick email or a text message, we can get you another copy. Um, and that's on the pre-listing side, things can also, you know, if things are updated, things can change in the report. It's, it's nice that way for, for people. So. Excellent. So uh, you talked a little bit about certifications before, but what kind of, and I know that the industry is, as a whole is not regulated, like, yep. like it's not, um, you don't have to have a certain level of certification to be a home inspector, but you guys do. And what kind of certifications are out there and what, what do you find are useful? So there's different certifications. Um, like I said, we're both nationally certified. Um, a lot of, uh, what's the, what's the organization you're certified under, you know? So mine is the national association. Okay. Then there's, there's different. So I have a certification. So does my dad through it's basically 
uh, company through the States. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a national test that you have to take. It's all proctored. You go to the college, you write it. Um, and then you can decide if you would like to join an association. Mm -hmm. Now the associations are changing a little bit. Some of them are amalgamating. There's a Canadian association, which is the biggest one, which my dad and I are a part of. Um, there's a few other, there's uh, NASHI, there's InterNASHI. Um, they all run, you know, different standards. Uh, there's stand standards of practice, um, which we follow. And that's about it. Um, you know, most of them require insurance and you're on your way. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. So the role of a home inspector uh, now in, in the time that you have, you know, somewhere between one and a half, three hours for most home inspections, you have to be a little bit of a generalist. So you're touching each of the different certifications. Sometimes my experience has been that that will stop and there's going to be the odd thing that might be kind of beyond the scope of what you can really dig into. Um, what kind of things might someone want to come back with a with more of a specialist? Now, the example I, I would give is say like, a flat roof where you've got a good general level of expertise on a, like a flat tar and gravel roof. But I've had, I've actually had you guys say, well, you know what, to get a really precise age of how, what kind of shape this is in, here's a company I might recommend. What are, what are some other ones like that? Yeah, we, we recommend things uh, when it comes to furnaces, you know, when we get into um, different things with furnaces, flame patterns, stuff like that, we'll recommend getting an HVAC tech out. Uh, to do carbon monoxide checks, to do a full service on the furnace. Uh, another one, depending on what it is, I mean, I've seen it in basements before where jack posts are moved and a structural engineer. We, are, are those those the, like the steel yeah. ones? Yeah, the adjustable, uh, yeah, posts that go underneath beams. We've seen those moved in basements. Uh, we've seen foundations that we've, like I said, with the relationships we've built on the construction side, um, had phone calls right during the inspection with uh, foundation experts yeah, we'll be there within the next day to come out and take a look and give the client a quote. Um, you know, foundation experts, HVAC tech, uh, like you said, flat roofing companies, um, structural engineers, those are kind of, I would say the top four that we, when they're out of our scope of work, we, we kick those up to. Okay. For their evaluation. Now, uh, another topic, maybe this one will be more fun, is, uh, so you work with a lot of realtors. So, and then actually, I know that there's a, a bunch of realtors that subscribe to this podcast. So as, as a realtor, especially if you are a new realtor, how can they help or hinder the process for you? Like basically, should they be getting out of the way? Is there any way they can help? What kind of, what kind of things can a realtor do to be a, an asset to, to you during this? So for most realtors, you guys are great. I mean, a lot of them will follow along and you get so much from the inspections, I feel anyways. A lot of in, uh, a lot of realtors like to follow along to try to learn a few things um, so they can kind of prep their clients next time. Um, the best thing I think for a realtor is to be within an earshot, uh, kind of keep an eye on how things are going and then just kind of let us do our thing. Um, you know, it's sometimes it gets tough with people that try to talk over and give their in, you know, input on certain things. Um, you know, it's, uh, I respect the job that, that you guys do. You're great at, uh, you're great at your, your real estate stuff. And I don't try to, you know, get in on the deals or anything like that. Just let us do your thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. This, yeah. That was so nice. That was so nicely politically worded. <laughs> basically what, what Scott is very nicely saying here is realtors. If you're listening to this, get out of the way like, like <laughs> not we're, so much yeah, not so much we're, yeah we're, we're you know uh my role as a realtor is not to be an expert at the at the home inspection this is the same reason i don't do photography or videography or you know stay like do staging myself i contract to people who are experts like you in 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 your field and i think that uh as a new for new realtors looking out there it says um you know we're looking to you for your expertise and then we can have a separate conversation with the clients afterwards to say, okay, here's our list of problems. What do we think about that? You know, yeah. is there anything that's to walk away from? Is there anything that we just live with it? Is there anything we renegotiate? And, and for us during the inspection, if there's something that major, you know, Nick, we oh, yeah. stop the inspection at that point and we'll have a serious discussion. 
you know, the input at that point is super valuable for you guys because you know your clients, you've worked with them a lot longer than we have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know their comfort level. That's that's a huge role for, for you guys at that point. Um, we certainly appreciate it. We've, we've had many inspections with great agents and they go, well, say, you know, foundation issues or uh, structural issues and the real estate grabbing the client walking out the door before we even, you know, continue on. So they, they know their client really well. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Uh, okay. So the, the last question I want to ask is just sort of a, is a value add for, for somebody looking who's owning a home out of all the inspections you've done, what are some tips? What are some really good tips, general tips that people have for maintaining their home? What, what are some things you say to have people have their home and the systems in it last longer? As in like, what kind of things get neglected the most? What are the most expensive mistakes that people aren't paying enough attention to? So what I tell people is to get familiar with their home, right? Your, your house is a system. It functions as one. You know, you don't really do something in the house without affecting something else. So, for example, filter changes in your furnace. That helps with your air conditioning. It helps with your heating. It helps with the efficiency. How often should you change them? Uh, usually every, I usually tell people 10 to 12 weeks, but check it once a month. If it's clean, put it back in. If it's dirty, switch it out. It's a very cheap way to keep things running properly mm -hmm. um, usually we tell people after the five-year mark have the furnace service once a year it's you know they check for carbon monoxide they make sure it runs properly those small tweaks back to the cars i can i compare it to oil changes in the car right you do that regular maintenance uh, grading and drainage on the outside make sure your downspouts are extended if there's no water that's coming down near your foundation and footing you're not, you're a lot less likely to have a leak. So make sure your lot is sloping away from the house. Your downspouts are extended, go around once a year. And I tell people, even during the inspection, when you're cutting your grass, look around, check out your windows, look for caulking, look for things that weren't there before. You know, when you're say you have a downstairs laundry unit, walk through the furnace room, listen, you know, get familiar with how things sound, how things are supposed to sound. So when they don't sound the same, you know, to call. Yeah. You know, or, or check things out. It's very Mr. Miyagi of you. <laughs> <laughs> become, become one with your home. That's it. That's it. It's, yeah. it's most people's biggest investment in their life. Yeah. So, you know, you'll take your car for an oil change every five to 8,000 kilometers or when it tells you to, but you leave a furnace filter in for three years and I've been guilty of it too. You know, oh, yeah. I do this for a living and I've definitely been guilty of leaving it too long. <laughs> yeah. So, um, if somebody wants to hire you, and they should, uh, in the Ottawa area, where can people find you? So we have a newly started Facebook page. We're getting a little bit better with our social media. We're going to start doing a bit more uh, marketing, have a better online presence. We have a website that's old, so we're right in the middle of getting a brand new one. Yep. Um, so through either text message, uh, Facebook, the full story. Um, we're looking at setting up an Instagram page. So we're and getting how, it. How's it spelled the full story? What's that, sorry? How's it spelled? Because it's spelled differently. So it's T-H-E-F-U-L-L-S-T-O-R-E-Y. Oh, just like your shirt. Yeah, just like my shirt. That's it. You got it. So Excellent. Uh, well, we will look to find you there. I really appreciate you having coming on here. Uh, you're, very, you're very good on camera. I, I didn't, I didn't know this until today. I'm, 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 so I'm going to have you back for more specific topics in the future if you're down for it. It's easy when you have a good host, you know, you just oh, keep it happening. And, yeah. Thank you very much. It's my, it's my amateur radio experience from the universe. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it, Scott. No and, problem. Uh, Thanks, Dad, I, take care. What is people first when it comes to real estate? After all, we're buying and selling properties. So is it really about people? People first just means that people are more important than properties. It means that at the heart of every move, there's a human story. And that's why my team and I have to be excellent for you every time you buy or sell a home. That's why we take so much time to educate all our clients on the market and on the process. That's why we are continually improving our processes, honing our negotiation skills so that you know you are getting Ottawa's best when you work with us. That's why we stay in touch year after year 
with our past clients because I believe and we believe as a team that being a business in Ottawa means that we have an obligation to our community to improve it, to serve it and to connect the people who live in it. In an era where property sales are often prioritized over people, our team puts relationships first. One client at a time, one relationship at a time. That's people first real estate.